I now would like to invite our keynote speaker to the stage. Janine Ellis is not your everyday self-made businesswoman. She has grown her juice and smoothie empire from a kitchen bench to an international success story. Janine will now share her knowledge with others. Indeed, she has already done that in many ways, including through her role as a shark and mentor on Channel 10's Shark Tank. And she says, if she can do it, anyone can. Let me introduce Janine Ellis, founder and executive director of Boost Juice Spas. Thank you. Wow, what an honor and what a great, what a great room and I'm thrilled to be here. You know, first and foremost, congratulations to all the graduates. Look, these, um, I was standing at the window and looking out uh, before you guys came in, I saw women with little children, I saw men with old grown up children, and I saw everyone from you know, all ages. And you sit down and you ponder what it takes for you to be here today. And the reality is the sacrifices that you make. I mean, you've, most of you have jobs. A lot of you have kids. And to actually commit to this is actually truly inspiring. So congratulations. Look, I thought I'd... <laughs> I thought I'd start with a little bit about me. I, you know, I, I want you to take away today that it doesn't matter really where you come from and what you do. It really it matters about what you do today and move forward. Now, I was born in 65, don't do the sums. And um, I was born in 65, and I was born to a woman who was a 50s housewife. And for her, she was all about, she was all about raising me to be the supporter. You know, if I wasn't pregnant, had my first child in 21, I'd pretty much failed. So clearly I was a failure. So, so she raised to say, no, you are the one to stay home. It's, you are there to be supportive and only supportive. I actually went to a tech school. Now, I don't know if anyone's even heard of a tech school, but a tech school was designed for workers. It wasn't for leaders. There was never leadership roles. It was, there was, <laughs> or courses. There was courses on woodwork sheet metal, cooking, sewing and typing. I thank God for typing. I can type 100 words a minute, but God help me with my cooking. Um, but the, the reality with that was that, again, I was taught that we were the followers and not the leaders. And you know, I didn't, I finished school at year 11. And the reason being was it wasn't a year 12. And I actually didn't actually go to university because no one went to university. It wasn't even spoken about. You just got it, you just got on with it. And what I found was that despite the fact that you have an upbringing to, to say certain things, the reality is you don't have to be that person. And I was, despite the fact that I was born in the era of you know, the Vietnam War and all this, thing, this element of change, I wasn't that entrepreneur that stood and sold lemonade at a lemonade stand. I was the one that actually wanted to travel. And, um, but before then, I thought, I'll try a few things. And you know, I don't know if there's a few people over here 40 or 45, but if you were, you might have seen me in my day where I was a model. And I actually was a, if I do say so myself, a pretty good model. And uh, I made a few front covers, and particularly if there's any truckies here. <laughs> I was uh, CB Action, if anyone even knows what CB Action is. Or there's always the dog enthusiast. So, you know, potentially, okay, I admit it, maybe uh, modeling wasn't my thing, but travel was, you know, travel was my thing. And for me, it was all about the adventure. And so for me, I wanted, when I wanted to go overseas, I, I had a backpack on my back and an idea that it'll all be fine, and naivety played a huge role in that. And so for me, it was all about travel and excitement. And so, yep, went to, went did it all, all over the world and found myself completely and utterly broke with $40 in my, in my pocket in the south of France. And, you know, you did what 21-year-olds do at, when you're in the situation where you've, you've, you've cashed your ticket home and you've got no money, you don't care because it'll work out. And sure enough, I, I talked my way into a job on the south of France as a stewardess on a boat. You know, because I clearly told them I'm from Melbourne, that you know, Melbourne has a huge yachting industry because you know, there was, and that I had all this experience on yachting because you've got to remember there was no internet back there and they couldn't check. <laughs> now you're screwed all you guys, you can't do it. 
So, yeah, so for me, it was actually about, okay, suddenly, yay, I've got all my problems are solved. And six weeks later, this guy bought it. So for the next, uh, for the next two years, I got to hang out with rock stars and movie stars. So for a girl from the Burbs who, you know, for me, rock stars and movie stars are superhuman. You know, they're not, there's us and there's them. Yeah, so, so for me, I'm going, suddenly I'm going, oh my God, that's David Bowie singing Space Oddity. And I'm meeting Mick Jagger and Robin Williams and Eric Idle from Monty Python and all of these amazing people. And what I realized is I realized people were just people. And I think about what I took into business and one of the things I took into business from travel was that, is that it doesn't matter where you're from. There are really super, super nice mega stars and rich people and there's some not so nice people. And there's some really super nice farmers and fishermen that used to help us with the fish, and there was not so nice. So when I went to business, when I went to rooms, I didn't feel like I was less than or more than anyone else, despite the fact that they were more educated than me or had more experience. I, knew, I went in with the student mentality, the student mentality in the sense that I could learn. What can I learn from them? And so that was one of the key things I took away. So for me, you know, <laughs> the interesting thing is you go, my God, I'm sure some of you are going, oh my God, she worked with David Bowie, how cool. But guess who uh, cleaned the toilets? That was me. <laughs> Look, I found out I was, so, you know, I, I was traveling for two years and I, I returned back, to, I told my mum actually before I left, you know, that I was coming back three, me, three months later and I actually returned seven years later with a two-year-old. So from that relationship, I know, karma, I've got kids now, they're killing me. Um, so from that relationship that I had on the boat, that, it, you know, for, for that was, I, you know, I was in a situation where I had a lovely man, but he wasn't my man. So I returned back to Australia with my beautiful little two-year-old son, Samuel, and was living back in Baronia. So here I am at 27 years old, starting again, literally again. And you know, through contacts and all the tenacity that I had, I got myself once again a job working with movie stars and, and um, rock stars, well, movie stars. And so I was a publicist at a company called United International Pictures. And so once again, I, I, this time I was actually hanging out with them and really sort of socializing with them. So I learned how important that was, that people were just people once again. But really, I, I actually, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the, my four tips on on actually what I believe and what I've learned over the last 20 years in business. But one of the key things that happened when I worked for UIP is I met my partner, Jeff. And he was, the, when, when, and we had three beautiful children, and I got to a point where I didn't want to work for someone again. I wanted to create my own destiny, because you know, I think naivety played more of a part in me being successful, because I didn't know what I didn't know than actually anything else. So, I, so we said, okay, we'll start a business. And quite often, if you pick up any business book, you'll actually read about all their failures before there was any successes, and, and we were the same. So the first thing was, we thought, okay, I'm a publicist, he's in radio, um, let's tour comedians, right? Had no experience in that again, but hey, what does that stop me? I was a nanny in France, it didn't stop me because I had no experience in babies, <laughs> particularly when I put the nappy on the wrong way. Um, and so suddenly I'm, I'm here touring a comedian, and we were promised from a guy in New York that we we're going to get Robin Williams and Eric Idle, and nine months later, we got a guy, a guy called Bob Smith. So that didn't make any money. Then we tried uh, publishing, that didn't make any money. But it was actually on a trip to America that I actually saw the Juice and Smoothie category. And I had that idea of, wouldn't it be good if? And a lot of good ideas start that way. You know, Vaughan, I was waiting for that idea, Vaughan, but didn't come. But I'm sure he has a, would, wouldn't it be good if? Wouldn't it be good if I could actually get more fruit and vegetables into people's diet? Wouldn't it be good if I could actually go out, out of my home and get something healthy? And so where are we now? You know, it, and it has been an absolute blast. You know, we've, we've done about $3 billion worth of sales since inception. We've got 95% awareness rate, which in, in five years, and the reason I'm excited about that is we had no money to market. You know, we, we had nothing. We had to sell our family home to actually fund the business. You know, actually, I'll tell you a quick story. I am... Um, it was a point, actually, in the early part of the businesses, we really didn't have any money. We really didn't have any. I didn't even know how I was going to pay my, my wages at one point. And that same week, 
I actually hit the uh, BRW rich list in, in uh, Young and it was hysterical because we'd sold a family home, had no money and apparently I'd made this, you know, this, this thing, got to believe the media. And um, I actually did go shopping and I brought all these bags home. My husband went, what are you doing? I said, apparently I can afford it. <laughs> Evidence. But look, I want to give you today the four things that I've learned uh, in the last 20 years. And I'm going to talk about edit, innovate, the art of not knowing, and a little bit what Vaughan touched on, which is love what you do. I'm going to start first and foremost with edit. You know, as you go through your, your business journey and you become the student, then you start to become the teacher. As a teacher, you know that you need to continue to learn. And I think earlier, about five years ago, I used to say um, the thing you need to be successful in business and in life is to you know, hire well, know your numbers, do a business plan, all of these, and all of those things are right. I then had a moment where I sat back and I went, actually, before you do all that, before you start that, there is one thing you need to do. That's marry well. <laughs> and Vaughan touch base, uh, touched on it. He mentioned his wife. And doesn't mean you can be successful if you're single. Of course you can be. And if you've married a dud, yes, you can be successful, right? You can, right? But the reality is, for you to guys to do what, you, what you've done, you need the support of the ones the closest and dearest to you. You know, for me to be able to do what we, we did, I mean, I, was, I had three young kids at home. I was traveling three months a year. We sold our family home. We were all in. And with the out support of the people closest to us, you just can't do it. So set yourself up for success. So when I say edit, what I mean is there is people around you that drag you down. Surround yourself with great people. If you've, if you've chosen a dad, wife, or husband, there's divorce. You'll be fine. Right? All other things. Right? So, so really, you know, try, you know, set yourself up to succeed. It's so good if you can, you know, it's so much sweeter a journey to do it with people you love. Second thing I've got, you cannot in this day and age not think about innovation. We are in an era now that we have never been before, that what we've done the last 50 years won't work in the next 10, in the next five, next year. It won't. And I can leave you with this, the seven most expensive words in business. And if you hear them in your business, and if you hear them in what you're doing, you need to then stop and think. The seven most expensive business words in business, we have always done it that way. We are in a new era. You know, Airbnb has no, has no real estate. We've got all of these businesses that are completely changing how we do business. And we've in an era also that we've never before in history has innovation offered promise to so much, to so many in such a short period of time, and it's true. What innovation has done is so exciting. It's, the change is ridiculous. Next year, 2019, if you have a spare $612,000, you can buy a flying car. You know, in 1960s, it was Jetsons and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. We are now in an era where we can buy a flying car, and let alone all the other millions of things that we can do right now. New Zealand are going to have flying taxis next year. We are in a time of change, and so in business, we have to change. The next one I want to talk to you about is the art of not knowing. Now, I can absolutely tell you right now that I am talking to the converted in this room because you already get that knowledge is the zest of life. Knowledge is what we are here for. And the older you, I get, the more I know I don't know and the more I'm sitting here and wanting to get the knowledge from wherever I can. You guys get that. It's easy. It is so much easier for you guys to say, I haven't got time. I'm learning enough in the work, but you wanted to know more. And so the people in this room is, forget that you've done an MBA and you've done other degrees in this room. The fact that you have an open mind, a curious mind, and you want to know more, that's success in itself. And not only that, that you actually went and despite the fact it was hard, despite the fact I'm sure there was times you went, God, you know, can I delay it? Can I, you know, it's just I haven't got the time for it. You stick stuck at it. So you are in a room today of like-minded people who are prepared to make it a little bit hard. When it's a little bit hard, they just keep pushing. So, you know, as I said, I am, I am honoured to be in the room with you guys. The, th the, the, the final one I want to talk to you about is what Vaughan touched on, which is love what you do. 
You know, I think it was a um, uh, Steve Jobs that, that actually said that. And I, someone says to me, he said, Janine, are you ever going to retire? I said, why would I retire for something I love? I'm never going to retire. <laughs> they want me to, but I'll be kicking and screaming and hanging on there. You know, I don't see about life balance. I just see there's life. You know, and so because I found the balance of the, the love, and I love the business. I love teaching. I love mentoring. I love helping the businesses on Shark Tank. You know, so, so I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. But I think one of the things are, that with you guys is that one of the things I've learned is that quite often we say no really quickly. You know, and you could have all said, no, I haven't got time for an MBA. No, I haven't got time for study. No, and in actual fact, people get, they say, you know, they who know everything say that we get five or six great opportunities put in our lap in our lifetimes. And often it's just so easy to say no. So what I'm saying to you is instead of saying no, let's say yes. Guys, thank you so much for ha having me. And once again, congratulations on this extraordinary thing you've achieved. And once again, I'm honored to be in this room. Thank you very much.